Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we will start the evening with a recital, a portion of the glorious Quran. And we are honored and pleased to have with us Hafid Rashid Brown, who will recite for us verses 250, 251, and 252 from chapter 2, Al-Baqarah. I give you now Hafiz Rashid Brown. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولم
آمنت بالله صدق الله مولانا الذين I believe in Allah verily Allah has spoken the truth I have on previous occasions similar to this had the privilege of sharing a platform with our brother Khafif Rashid Brown and it appears to me that each time I hear him he sounds even better and I'm sure you will agree with me I take it upon myself on your behalf to confer on him the title Asultil Jannah, the voice from heaven may he always be around inshallah Brothers and sisters Ladies and gentlemen, it is a further privilege for me once again on behalf of our host Salih Muhammad to share a platform with our great brother from Durban, Ahmad Dirat. I have no intention of boring you with introductions. He needs no introduction. He has many critics. But those people who do nothing never are criticized. And those people who criticize find it impossible to do one tenth or one hundredth or one thousandth of what Brother Dida has done. I don't have to tell you that he is a household name not only here, not only in the Middle East, but throughout the whole world. It is therefore my esteemed pleasure to introduce you to him again tonight and to his topic. Brother Ahmadinat will speak to us on the topic Islam's answer to the new world order. May I just remind you that this is a formal gathering, it therefore has a format. Brother Ahmad will speak to us and thereafter when it comes to question time, I will remind you of what the format will be. And now I have a great pleasure in calling upon Ahmad Dirat to speak to you. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقتل داود جالوتا وأعطاه الله الملك والحكمة وأعلمه ما يشاء ولولا دفع الله الناس بعضهم ببعض لفسدت الأرض ولكن أكثر الناس لا ولولا دفع الله الناس بعضهم ببعض لفسدت الأرض ولكن الله ذو فضل على العالمين صدق الله صدق الله العظيم Mr. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters I repeated one of the ayahs from Sumi that our brother has read our Qari the voice from heaven Alhamdulillah he was reading as the chairman indicated from Surah Al-Baqarah starting from ayah numbers 250, 51, 52 and so on I read to you from that same surah, ayah number 251. And here is a happy occasion that this is one of the rare occasions when the Muslim, the Jew and the Christian, they can be united. On this first statement of the Quran, of ayah number 251, it says, وَقَتَلَ and Daud has a Daud al Islam, the prophet David. He killed Goliath. Wa qatala Daud al Jaluta, wa ta'ullahu al Murka, and Allah gave him dominion, wa hikmata, and wisdom, wa Allah mu min ma'asha, and whatever else he willed. The Jew says, David killed Goliath. The Christian says, David killed Goliath. The Muslim says, David killed Goliath. Amazing. All three are agreed. That Hazrat Dawud he slew this giant Goliath. Now, the next statement after that, Allah says, وَلَوْلَا دَفْقُ اللَّهِ النَّاسَ بَعْضُ Had he not checked up one group of people by another, لَفَسَدَتِ الْأَرْضُ 
they would have been much mischief in the land. But Allah is full of bounty to all the worlds, to all his creatures. The subject of this evening's talk, Islam's answer to the new world order, hails from this Quranic ayah that if Allah did not check up one group of people by another, there would have been much mischief in the land. There has always been in Allah's creation, a balance of power. In the time of our Nabi Karim Sallallahu the East and the West, the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire, they were at fighting. There was a balance of power. In recent times, we had Communist Russia and the Western democracies, America. Both of them with atom bombs, checking one another. Had it not been for one group checking at the other, there would have been, as Allah says, much mischief in the land. Imagine Russia without America. What she would not have done? She marched into Afghanistan, invaded Afghanistan. And India, Pakistan, all would have been all in like nine things they would have fallen. The whole thing was hers. But you need somebody to check it out. So America comes along with their own interests and they start helping the people and one of the mightiest nations on earth, the Russians, with their atom bombs and all, they were defeated. And the balance was there all the time. That America doesn't go to extreme. <coughs> she wanted to invade Cuba. Cuba. Russia says you dare touch Cuba. So we will atom bomb you. 1956, Britain, Israel and France, they struck at Egypt in collusion, and they were almost on the verge of knocking it out. The blessings of America is there. Two for America and for Britain, France, and Israel. America, Russia gives a warning in 1956. It says, you stop your invasion immediately or a rocket bomb Paris and London. <laughs> immediately. There is a balance of power going on. But now, like a bubble, the Russian bubble has burst. Perish. There's only one superpower now. America. And she is running them off, you can see. <laughs> Panama. She invaded Panama. Granada. Now, Somalia. She is throwing her weight around. And there is nobody to check her. But Allah says there must be a, a balancing force. There must be a balancing force. And they have discovered this balancing force, the West, in Islam. That Islam is now the target. The Muslim world is the target of America. She is a challenge. She is a challenge to the West. Islam is a challenge. And there is no doubt about that. See, from every aspect, from every point of view, the Muslim is telling the West that, you know, your promiscuousness is not good. Your alcoholism, your drunkenness is not good. Your gambling is not good. You eating the flesh of swine is not good. At every step, the Muslim is telling the West where to get off. This is not right. This is not right, sir. This is not right, sir. And we have been a challenge to the West for centuries. The Muslims were the only people that went to Europe as kings. Do you know that? The Muslim nations were the only Muslim people who went the only Asiatic people who went to Europe as kings, as rulers. The Phoenicians had gone there as traders, the Jews were taken as fugitives or captives, the Muslims went as rulers. They went and ruled Spain for 800 years. And this was at the time when Europe was just beginning to become conscious of the nationality that we are a people. At that time in their history, the Muslims were knocking at their doors from Vienna to Turks, in Austria, and this side in Spain, 800 years. So the Muslim has been an eternal challenge, religiously also. Islam has come up with Christianity and is telling the Christians that the fulfillment of the teachings of Moses and Jesus are found in Muhammad. So religiously the Muslim is a challenge. In his social way of life is a challenge, so he's a challenge. And now he is becoming the focus of the Western world. So they are now planning, the West is planning, a new world order. And here is a 
beautiful publication from the color point of view, beautiful publication. What's behind the new world order? If you saw this in, in the bookstore, you'll buy it. And it says here the hidden agenda. Almost no one dares to discuss. Wouldn't you like to know? The hidden agenda, which no one dares to discuss. And they're discussing it here. How will it affect you? How will it affect you? Now, everybody will buy this book. This has become a bestseller. But now when you open the book, you find it has really got nothing to do with this new world order. This is a ruse, a stratagem of selling their books. You read inside that this, the whole book, is concerned with Pope bashing. Bashing the, His Holiness the Pope. Bashing the Roman Catholic Church. This is one of the sects of Christendom called the Seventh-day Adventists. They publish this book. Now, in the guise of telling you about what's behind the New World Order, they are now brain, brainwashing you, programming you into bashing the Roman Catholic Church and Baba the Pope. In this book here, this little book, they go on to say that His Holiness the Pope is the beast, beast. In the book of Revelation in the Bible, the last book of the Bible, a beast is mentioned, a creature, you know, who is the filthiest, dirtiest thing, creating evil, and his number is six. Six, six. The number of the beast is six. There's a code name. There's a code name for the beast is six. Six, six. Now this book on page 49 proves three times over that it is the Pope is the beast. The Pope is the beast. The Pope is the beast. From three different angles they're trying to prove. Then they are now advertising a book. And the title of the book is Will America survive? Will America survive? And it has become number one bestseller in America. Naturally, every American who is literate, he wants to be. What about my country? Will it survive? What is the problem? How does it affect me? <laughs> and it's a 672 page book. Will America survive? 672 pages. But this book is 100 year old. How did it become the world's bestseller? It's 100 year old. Oh, the Americans are geniuses. The title of the book was The Great Controversy, written by Mrs. Ellen G. White, a divorcee. She created the movement, she had the spare time and the energy to write 672 pages attacking the Roman Catholic Church and proving that seventh day, Saturday is the seventh day they should have for worship. 672 pages. So, as the thing is gone out of business, nobody wants to buy that book anymore. But these Americans are geniuses. They changed the title. The title of the book is the same, 672 pages, written by Mrs. Ellen G. White. You change, give it a new clothes, new uniform. The new title is, Will America Survive? <coughs> and it's become personal. Same book, same name, but different game. Same name, different game. So, I, I was tempted to go through this book. I says, no, this book is a hoax. It's a hoax. But now this is how they sell it. Because the bestseller just changed the title. This is the old title you used to, you won't buy that anymore. You won't buy it. This is now. Will America survive? Every American wants to buy. <laughs> bestseller. Now, this new world order has been mooted by George Bush. George Bush. This is what he says. This is what he said. It is a big idea. This new world order is a big idea. A new world order where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause. Diverse nations, different nations get together, common cause. Only the United States has both a moral standing. Only the United States has a moral standing and the means to back it up. Says President George Bush in his State of the Union address reports the Los Angeles Times of 18th February, 1991. 
So America has come to the forefront to lead the world into this new world order. And we can see she has the moral standing. One of the most immoral nations on earth. And she claimed to have a moral standing. In the United Nations, more than 100 resolutions had been passed, I'm sorry, had been mooted against her illegitimate child Israel. And every one of them, America vetoes. The whole world is on one side, and America and the illegitimate child Israel, they are on the other side. They win the day. They have the power of veto. They have the big stick. That's a moral standing. 110 resolutions she veto. Anything you say about Israel, it says veto. Anything the whole world says about Israel, veto, veto, veto. More than 110 vetoes in the United Nations. That gives her that more right to be now going through her weight all over the world, wherever in Somalia, they're knocking hells into the Somalis. In Bosnia, Herzegovina, the people, the Muslims are struggling there to survive. And in that, they have imposed an embargo, an arms embargo upon the Muslims, a small community of Muslims, surrounded by the Croats and the Serbs. Well armed, they have their own munition factories, they manufacture it, but now for the Muslims, arms embargo. Nobody dare supply them with arms. And this is the moral standing. This is the moral standing of these Western nations, so-called Christians. But what do I even they do? They have a Christian banner. They say this is Christendom, this is Western Christianity, Britain, France, and America. They are the main Security Council members, and they veto anybody who says no, no, no. Anybody tells you, says, look, please help the poor Bosnian Muslims. You know, every nation has a right to self-defense. It's a fundamental human right. Given the master historian in his decline and fall of the Roman Empire, he said, that in the state of nature, every, every person has a right to defend his person and his position and to extend his hostilities to a reasonable amount of satisfaction and retaliation. Everybody has a right to defend himself, his wife, children, family, possessions. Everyone has a right. But not the Muslims. The Muslims of Syria, of Bosnia, they have no right. Let them be slaughtered, massacred, ethnic cleansing, wipe them out. <laughs> Mitterrand, the Prime Minister of France. He said, I will never allow Islamic State in Europe. I will never allow. Who are you? You are a God. What makes you to say that? No, it's a might that you have. If a nation, a group of people, they choose to look, we'll have a communist system. They have a right. The majority of the people in a piece of land, they say we would have a communist system. They have a right. They said we would have a Hindu system. They have a right. They said we would have a Christian government. They have a right. The majority of the people in any situation, they have a right to choose the way of life that they want. But not for Muslims. No, no. So I never allow. In other words, take direct intervention to see that it doesn't happen. No. America has become the big boss and I have had personal experience of this new world order just last month. I go to the land of liberty, fraternity and equality. You know what country is that? What country? The land of liberty, fraternity and equality. No. The French Revolution, France, France. The revolution that took place, this is for liberty, fraternity, and equality. For who? For who? For themselves. One million Algerians they killed before the Algerians got the freedom from the French. That, that liberty is for themselves. Fraternity is for themselves. That equality is for themselves. This is the hypocrisy of the West. For the America, everything that's American, suit them, that is law, that is hot, that is right. The French, the same. The British, the same. This is the sickness of the Western nations. They have a stick in the hand, and might is right. With a stick in your hand, <laughs> we are the same. That the person says, this buffalo is mine. The cow is a black, black animal. Buffalo, buffalo is mine. So when you claim your buffalo, it's your buffalo, but I give you one stick on your head. So whose buffalo is it? He says, mine, I give you another one. So whose buffalo is this? 
You don't understand religion. So, uh, the stick is in his hands, everything. Mind is light. So, in this land of liberty, fraternity, liberty, and, and equality, I'm called on the lecture tour. On the 15th of September last month, I leave Durban, and on this morning of the 16th, I land in London, and across the channel, the same morning, I'm in France. I arrived at Charles de Gaulle Airport. The immigration officer, he does things automatically. You know, he doesn't care. He sees, as soon as I present, pass, present my passport, he takes my passport, he opens it, looks for the visa, he saw the visa. A valid visa given to me by the French Embassy in South Africa, costing me 200 rands. The most expensive visa I ever had in my life. 200 rands for the visa. <laughs> So, with a valid visa, the guy sees the visa, and on the opposite page is a blank page. So he stamps it. Charles de Gaulle Airport, 16 September. He's... Then he looks up to me. He sees this toby, and he sees this beard. And bells begin to ring in his head. Yeah, this is something strange. This is a strange creature has come into France. <laughs> there are some two million Muslims there, mostly Arabs, from Morocco, and from Algeria, and from Tunis. But generally, they are all, you know, very, they, they, they have, uh, they have nothing on the head, and they have no beards, the clean shape, but almost all of them. But here is a strange creature with something there to identify him as somebody. He stands for something. And I do. I believe in the principle that the label shows your intent, wear it. If your label, your identity shows what you stand for, wear it. Unless your life is in danger. I believe in this. That this is my identity. I want the people to know I'm a Muslim. And this also shows this. Look, there's a combination. I'm a Muslim. I wear this identity. He sees his identity and lights begin to blink in his head. So this guy is a danger. So he touched my name on the computer. And I appear. I can see it, but I know what's going on. He sees my name and he presses the button. I didn't see him pressing the button. But just within a few seconds, I see three guys. And behind him, over the shelf, they're looking on from the outside. The then closure, which is seated. And there may be curiosity mongers. They just want to know what's going on there. And there's nothing else to do. But no, 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 no. They have a special branch, people, to hear now what's going on, what I'm going to say. Three hours they interrogated me. Three hours. And they kept me for 11 hours before pushing me back to London. I said, I want to go to Saudi Arabia. There's a visa waiting for me at the Saudi Embassy. Please let me go and get the visa and send me to Saudi Arabia. The ticket is here. I got a ticket for Saudi Arabia. I said, no. I said, look, send your police with me. So I go along and get the visa and come back. So no. So your son can go. I said, right. Let my son go and give him my passport. He said, no. You and your passport are inseparable. You can't separate the two. So passport must remain. I said, then how can I get the visa? I went to the first place to get to London. And from London, I got the visa to go to Saudi Arabia and I made a trip last month. Now what made them to put me on that danger list? What did I do that I should deserve such an honor from the French door? <laughs> ah, I remember. As, <clears throat> you see, I have numerous books. I've written these booklets. They were available for you. If you haven't taken them on the way back, way, way out, pick them up. You can pick them up. I have written books. Booklets, actually. What the Bible says about Muhammad, and I had it translated into French. Same book in French. <laughs> Muhammad, the natural successor to Christ, I had it translated into French. Hmm? Muhammad the greatest, Muhammad the greatest, I had translated into French. Al Quran. The Miracle of Miracles. I had translated it into French. <laughs> and all my other little books, about 20 of them, 14 to 20 of them, we had them translated into French. But we have no market in South Africa for French books. So I'm trying to get through to France. And I managed to get a list of 300 Muslim names. 
names and addresses of Muslims in France. So I post 300 parcels. And they go and land in France with a bag. They immigrate the customs. They, they notice it's identical parcels. 300 of them. What's, what's going on? And they look closely at the parcels. It's Muslim, 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 Muslim. Every parcel is addressed to Muslims. So there is a conspiracy at work. There must be something here that the people are planning an overthrow of the French government. <laughs> they think like 300 parcels, identical parcels, same size, and all addressed to Muslims. Naturally, the French became suspicious. So they started opening my books, start reading them. And they found something. They did find something. That is the most dangerous book. Salman's Rushdie's satanic verses is translated in French. His kosher is halal. Ahmad Didat's books are dangerous. A land of liberty, fraternity, equality. Double standards. This one here is a danger to France. What makes it a danger? They open up and they read. I'm quoting a Frenchman here. A French historian by the name of La Martine. In 1854, about 150 years ago, this Frenchman wrote a, a, a book called The History of the Turks in French. And the Turks, incidentally being Muslims, he spoke something about our Nabi Karim Salas, about the Holy Prophet. Speaking about our Nabi, he says in his book, La Martin, which I quote here, in English as in French. <coughs> speaks of us. Turns being Muslims, look, they follow the religion of Islam and the Prophet is the Holy Prophet Muhammad. And this man Muhammad, what he has to say about him? He says, if greatness of purpose, smallness of means, and outstanding results are the three criteria of human genius who could dare to compare any great man in modern history with Muhammad. He dares you to produce your candidate to compare with this man Muhammad. Greatness of purpose, what the man is out to do. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A reclamation of the whole of mankind. Saving them from idol worship, from adulteries, from drunkenness, from gambling, from racism, from reclamation of the whole of mankind, as Allah testifies. This is Wama Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we have not sent you, Muhammad? Except as a mercy to the whole of mankind. That's just greatness of purpose, what he's out to do, to reclaim the whole of mankind. Smallness of means with what he starts. His capital, his capital, Muhammad's capital. Before he's born, his father dies. By the time he six, his mother dies. He's doubly often by the time he's six. Then two years, his grandfather looks after him when he dies. Then he's looking after his uncle Abu Talib's goats. This capital. No royalty to back him up, no political party to back him up. <laughs> With this, what he starts, smallness of means and outstanding results. <laughs> One billion Muslim, thousand million Muslims in the world today. The fastest growing religion on earth today is Islam. We are not so successful here, but overall in the world, in America, is the fastest growing religion. In Britain, is the fastest growing religion, Islam. <laughs> Outstanding results are the three criteria of human genius who could dare to compare any great man in modern history of Muhammad. He's daring you to, to produce your candidate to compare with this man Muhammad. There isn't anybody. And he ends his beautiful tribute by saying, our Nabi, philosopher, orator, apostle, legislator, warrior, conqueror of ideas, the restorer of rational beliefs, of a third without images, the founder of 20 terrestrial empires and of one spiritual empire. That is Muhammad. With regards all standards, all standards, whereby human greatness may be measured, we may well ask, is there any man greater than he? Is there any man greater than he? The answer is in the question. The answer is reposed in the question. Meaning, no man greater than Muhammad, the greatest man that ever lived was Muhammad. And he is confirming what Allah says. When azim, most certainly thou Muhammad stands on the highest pinnacle of behavior. And a Frenchman confirms it. 
This, the French authorities couldn't digest, couldn't stop. So, all my books were returned. All the parcels came back. And you can understand, each and every parcel had a rubber stamp on, unknown, unknown, unknown. 300 unknowns? How is it possible? <laughs> no, but that's the only thing I could say. And we can understand what's the game, who can be approved, who can talk to, or how did this happen, that these parcels went out, posted, wasted, the thing comes back, unknown, 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 and we were reconciled, what to do? We have forgotten about it. Now, they see me in person. I get the visa, I inform the people that look, I'm coming on the 16th, I'm arriving, and you can hear any lectures. So the Muslims there, they went to the Ministry of Interior, got permission for my lecture. They got permission. It's like a police state. Unlike South Africa, Alhamdulillah, look, we have a meeting. You don't have to go and ask the government. City Hall, Cape Town, you have a meeting, Green Point Drive. You don't have to get a prior permission from the government. You want to publish a book, you go and publish it. If somebody has objection, they can lodge it with it. Uh, Information Department of Information, and if they think this is not worth, they'll call you up and tell you that this book is not uh, right. And if you can defend yourself, you can defend your book. We had gone to court against the government, and Alhamdulillah, we had won. We had won against the government, so they give you a fighting chance with all this apartheid regime and justices and all. They give you a freedom of speech, which is second to none in the world. I have to, we have to give credit. Second to none in the world. City Hall, Cape Town, I go and lecture there, Christianity, Communism of Islam, which has the answers to the problems of South Africa, and no interference. <coughs> Actually, that means the P from the title, you can see that the man is going to prove that Islam is the answer, not Communism and not Christianity. Islam is the answer, but no interference from the government. This land of liberty, what did it They give permission, the municipality give them permission for the hall, and they advertise, and somebody sees the advert one who had been seeing the books. And immediately he activated the government to stop me from entering the country. Stop. And I was stopped. Double standards. Rushdie's book, Satanic Verses, is halal, is jayas, is kosher. Ahmad did that books are dangerous, out of reach for the, Muslim, for the people in France. Now, this reminded me That what is a nuclear power? France is a nuclear power with a nuclear bomb. That nuclear power gets shaken up by this old man with this beard and this topic. Huh? There's something strange. What is it? You think I'm that powerful? I'm that dangerous? We have nuclear power? No. They had a valid reason. To me, they had a valid reason. I've been reading a book written by an American, Dr. Joseph Adam Pearson. He wrote a book on the life of one about our prophets. The worst than Pushkin. I didn't want to start making big noise, making a propaganda. We we'll make him famous. As Rushdie was made famous, people said, Rushdie is Saturday versus Saturday versus people said, let's see what the Saturday versus is. He became a bestseller. I said, no, this Hadith, you don't want to propagate it, Dr. Pearson, leave him alone. But in the crap that he excretes in his book, of there is a jewel, there is a diamond. Believe me, in that crack, in that filth, there is a jewel, a diamond. I found a diamond inside there, that rubbish. In that stinking stuff, I found a diamond. The diamond is that Dr. Pearson, he says, he said, people who worry, People who worry about nuclear weaponry falling into the hands of the Arabs. The West is worried. So one day the Arabs will have the atom bomb. See, the Iraq was trying to get it. They allowed Israel to go knock it out. Libya, this is Libya might have it. Pakistan, they want the Islamic bomb, Islamic bomb, Pakistan. India has got it, it's okay. But Pakistan doesn't have it. Korea can have it, China can have it. Israel can have it, but Pakistan must not have it. Islamic bomb. Says so one day, if this Arabs can invent one, they might buy one from China, they might buy one from Korea. And they're worried about the illegitimate baby, Israel. That any Arab nation getting that bomb, there's only one thing they can call is Israel. And that's this illegitimate bastard child of America. That you can't tolerate. 
That, for that reason, Islamic form, Islamic form, Islamic form. So this American, he says, people who warn me about nuclear weaponry falling into the hands of the Arabs, fail to realize that the Islamic bomb has been dropped already. <laughs> the Islamic bomb has been dropped already. Now, I want to give a chance to my sisters. Tell me, where, when? This Quran is yours. First chance goes to my sisters. This American says that the Islamic bomb has been dropped already. That's in the past tense, huh? It's already dropped. Where, when? Come, come, my sisters. This book is yours. They are available there in the front. Those of you who haven't got a Quran translation, I say, take one. Take one, they're 10 rands each, 2,000 pages, it's cheap, it's cheap. Allah is cheap. It's the best investment that you can ever make. This Quran. Everything on your fingertips, that index, everything, whatever you want to know on your fingertips. This book here, this is by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. If you have one, you don't need another. But to give a present for it, you know, birthday parties or wedding parties to the bride, to the groom, no better present than this Allah's Kalam. But now I want to give this to my sisters. And please tell me where and where is my sister? Huh? Makkah. Huh? Ikra. Come, come, you lose nothing. You lose nothing. 14 years ago, it was already been dropped. When and where did this bomb fall? The birth of Muhammad. By the birth of Nabi Muhammad. This book is yours. When you go going out time, you take this. He says, it fell the day Muhammad was born. She said, right. It fell the day Muhammad was born. The atom bomb of Islam fell the day Muhammad was born. He is the Islamic bomb. We don't value him. We take him for granted. We read the Durud Sharif and Salami and all that, mashallah. But we don't realize the man's work. The enemy, he realizes that Muhammad is the Islamic bomb. At the age of 40, he came to fruition. First data material of the Islamic bomb started getting collected in the Quran. This book that he left behind is the data material of the Islamic bomb. And my sin is that out of those data material, I have been taking out verses, rays of light out of that to write my books. Uh, this, this, this is the only thing I knew. And we... Mm -hmm. The first book. The first book. <coughs> what the Bible is about Muhammad. It starts inside. You take the booklet, it starts. This one starts with an ayah from the Quran. Bismillah. Amen. From Surah Ahqaf, chapter 46, verse 10, and the whole book is a commentary on that ayah. Is my commentary on that ayah. Next one. Muhammad the natural success with Christ. It starts. Another ray of light in the Quran from that atom bomb, from that data material that Muhammad has left. I just borrow a verse and I start my commentary. This is my commentary on that. This is what shaking the French and shaking the world actually. See, Muhammad the greatest. Starts. It starts with another ayah from the Quran. Wa inna kala ala khulukin azim. So most certainly thou Muhammad standest on the highest pinnacle of behavior. From Surah Al Kalam, chapter 16, verse 4. And my commentary. This one here, Al Quran, the miracle of miracles, starts. Ulla ini tatam atil insu al jinn. Allah yaktu bi misli hazir Quran. La yaktu nabi mislihi. Wala ukana ba'ruhum li badin zahira. Surah Al Nisra'i, chapter 17, verse 88. I start with that in my commentary. So this is more powerful than the atom bomb. The nuclear power is shaken with this. See the logic of it, the logic of it, they can see that not just throwing 
murder people, that you people are going to go to hell, you know, you people are already drunkards, you know, you are like this, you are already promiscuous, because so many quarter million abortions a year taking place in your country, quarter million abortions, innocent children, uh, defenseless children, you murder them, quarter million, nothing of that kind, nothing of that kind. We are only giving you a commentary of these Quranic ayahs from that atom bomb that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi left. Out of that, rays of light are taken out and expanded, 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 which makes it too hard for the French to swallow. Now, they are terrified. See, Islam is a challenge. John Bernard Shaw, a British playwright, he said, if any religion has a chance of conquering England, near Europe, within the next hundred years, that religion is Islam. Not with a gun, not with a grenade, but with the internet. If any religion has a chance of conquering England, near Europe, within the next hundred years, is that religion is Islam. And they know. Islam is growing in Britain. And in France, there are two million Muslims there. And you have to talk to the people according to their background and experience. And to do that, before leaving for France, I learned French. It's a, it's a hobby. If I go to a new country, I try to learn the language of the people. I was only in good Indonesia, so I learned Indonesian. And in the city hall of Cape Town, I was demonstrating to the people. I said, you see, every language is beautiful and every language is unique. But when we don't know a language, that language seems funny to us, silly to us. So I started telling the people, I said, now look, I want you people to vote for the silliest language that I'm going to speak. So saying, I said, look, I'm speaking English to you. You Malays are more bilingual than the Afrikaners. You know, you speak English as good as your Afrikaners. At home you speak Africans like the Afrikaner, and with me you speak English as good as the Englishman. You are most bilingual people. So I'm speaking English. It sounds natural to you. If I speak Afrikaans, as a mar X a yellow bar eight, did this way four bell of the take wehan, one that's take as me wehan me. So you say, well, this has got some queer that said, you know, some funny way of saying it. But there's nothing funny about the language. There's nothing funny about the language. There's funny about my pronunciation, but nothing funny about the language. Then I quoted some verses in Zulu. You used to listen to Khaza. Khaza and Zulu are sister languages, dialects of the same language. Again, it's not so funny. Then I quoted Swahili. He said, Tazamini mi kono yangu, nani mi yangu. Yagua ni mi 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 <laughs> so that means they voted. They voted already. I didn't have to ask. You voted that the silliest and the funniest language is this last one. So I'm asking my audience, back it's the city hall back, with mostly my Muslim brothers and sisters, mostly Malays. Mostly Malays. So I said, what language is that? They don't know. I said, that's your language. Damn fools, this is your language. <laughs> Your language is the silliest and the funniest language. How can you say such a thing? Hmm? No, the reason is for 300 years we didn't hear it. And it's 10,000 miles away from here. So you, there's no chance of you just going to hear it. So that language, because you didn't hear it, it sounds the silliest and the funniest. But if you were an Indonesian or a Malaysian, ah, this is the sweetest language. Ten go clap, tan gan go, dan kaki go. You say so. That's a bit. So now, I have this hobby of mine. I learned French. And that's the hardest language. I thought. I know Spanish. I can give you Spanish. Uh, Hebrew, I can give you. Uh, Nigerian, I can give you. He, so many languages. About 20 different languages I can give you. But the hardest I found was French. You know, at this old age, wanting to learn a new words, you know, the pronunciation. And I forget. And again, I hammer the thing in. And again, it, it falls off in front of the brain. And it, it was ordeal, ordeal. But I did it. 
I did it while I'm traveling from Durban to London, to all the way. I was a super man. Je vous dis la vérité. Il a un de jour. Pour vous, que je parle, car si je ne parle pas, les gouttes de tiers ne viendra pas à vous. Mais si je m'avais, je vous l'avais. Ah, I did it. I did it. I did it. I'm still standing on and on. I said, when I land in France, I'm going to tell these Muslims. I said, look, man, this old man, I took the trouble of learning this in French. Why can't you do the same? See, if this old man of 75 can do it, why can't you young people do the same? And this is, you are speaking the language. This is a foreign language to me. And it's a very difficult language, especially for those I was told. If you know English first, then French is very difficult. If you just throw you into France, in the French environment, without you knowing English, you can learn it quickly. But if you learn English first, because it's phonetic, it's a BAD pad, CAD cat, RAT red, MAT mat, mm, French is not like that. <laughs> so, it's very really difficult. I learned it. I learned it. Now, in the second book of mine, Muhammad the Natural Senses of the Christ, I'm quoting an Afrikaans verse. It's in the English one, there's Afrikaans is there. And it's a very, very beautiful way of starting with the Afrikaans, I found. I need an African. I apologized to him. I said, you know, sir, I was uh, I'm, I'm in South Africa for 60 years, and I can't speak Afrikaans. You know, I said, I feel very sorry, very sorry. My apologies. I said, you see, the reason is, when I went to school, they didn't teach us Afrikaans at school, and that's a fact. But my children are doing very well. My children are learning Afrikaans. But you see, me, in my own way, I'm trying to learn the language. And you see, what I do is I use the Bible. I know the Bible extensively by heart in English. So if I want to learn another language, I get a Bible in that language. That's how I learned French. That's how I learned Indonesian. That's how I learned Swahili. Every, I get a Bible in that language. So I want to learn Afrikaans, so I get an Afrikaans Bible. And what I already know, I memorize that. So I'm telling the African, I says, you know, your language is a unique language. Absolutely unique. Actually, all languages are unique, says the Quran. They are all signs of Allah's creation. That every language is mir miraculous and every language is unique. But yours is more special. It's the youngest of the world's languages, Afrikaans. And I said, it is absolutely unique. I said, you see, use, use full negatives to prove a positive. So what are you talking about? I said, you see, you know, in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16, verse 7, it says, Mar exat yala di bar hate. Did you say yala fur belich bet ek wechan? Man is ek as ni, wechan ni, salis to rest at ni, na yala kom ni. Mar ek as wechan, salik hom na yala stier. It says, ni, 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 ni. Four negatives to prove a positive. There's not another language on earth with best life. Marek has, ni, wechan, ni, salitur, said, ni, ni, ya, ni, ya, ni, ya, ni, ya, ni, ya, ni, ni. The guy's interested. He knows it's classic. What I'm calling is classic. The other one is saying, oh, and this is a good finish. Or who more is a good more finish. But now, this what I'm speaking is something classical to him. It's what I'm having, 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 having from this movie by then. I'm quoting it exactly word for word. He wants to know this is what I'm on. So I said, this is the Who is this toast? If you know this is the Holy Ghost, I said, well, it's the same thing as the Holy Ghost. Shh, then you go start. The guy doesn't know what he did. By the time you finish, he doesn't know what he did and how it started. He doesn't know. He can't remember. I said, say, you know, I don't know Afrikaans. But you know, I was trying to learn your language. And you know, this is how I do it. And you know, your language is a beautiful language. It's a unique language. And you know, you got four negatives to prove a positive. It's by it's by it's by There's so many ways of getting at the people. Share it. Talk to them. Right. The French testified by dividing it from France that the literature, that is what I talk, what I'm talking is very different. 
the arguments, the presentation, the reasoning, the logic that I am giving you is a very important argument. I didn't know. I didn't know how important it was. To me, I'm just doing my job. This is natural to me. What I know, I want to share. What I know, I want to share. But the enemy realizes your potency. The French, they discovered me, they sent all my books back. Mm -hmm. Now here is a magazine called The Commission of the Baptist Church in America. The Baptist Church in America, they have a magazine called Commission, come out every month. Beautiful magazine. It is not intended for our wives. It's not meant for you or for me. That's for the Baptists. But I managed to get this copy. And in this copy here, some of a Baptist journalist of this magazine called Commission, he visited South Africa. And in South Africa, he is making research to find what the Muslims are doing here. And they find somebody in South Africa whom they call a defender of Islam. Ahmad Didar is a defender of Islam. That's what they discovered. In my absence, they came to my office. And they went around and they had chat, they found out what we are doing. And at the end of it, they say, this is what they're telling to the, to the Baptists, Christian Baptists, missionaries. For anyone who would witness to English-speaking Muslims, if you want to go to them, for anyone, any Christian missionary, wants to come along and talk to English-speaking Muslims, people who speak English, for anyone, who would witness to English-speaking Muslims, especially in Africa. The broadsides of Islamic defender, Ahmad Didar, may be required reading. You have to read Ahmad Didar first. <laughs> because as soon as they come to you, oh, this is what Didar is talking, maybe you talk the same way. You're also say, Marek, Sayyadri, Marek, did you say that? Because you listen to me, he said, if you, and they say, you might find. The guy says that my Bible is God's word. It's the word of God. Hmm? So you say, no, my Quran is the word of God. The battle, the battle between us, the Muslim and the Christian, is the two books. We say, the Quran is Allah's Kalam, word of God. The Christian say, the Bible is Allah's Kalam, word of God. The Christian say, the Bible is not the word of God. I mean, the Quran is not Allah's Kalam, it's not the word of God. The Muslim says, your Bible is not the word of God. The Christian says, you're going to go to hell. Christian is telling us, they come into our homes, drink our tea, eat our kusistas, <laughs> and our samosas, samosas, and our samosas and bajiyas, mm -hmm. and they send us to hell in our own homes. <laughs> you know that? They drink our tea, eat our kusistas, and they come down and they send us to hell. <laughs> the guy says, Christ died for my sins, who died for yours? And the Muslims are thinking. Today, it puts you in the world. The Muslim is put in the world. So, who died for my sins? He says, Christ died for my sins. Who died for yours? He said, Did Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam die for our sins? He says, No. Did Abu Bakr Siddiq die for our sins? He says, No. Omar Usman Ali? He says, No. Hassan Hussein? He says, No. So, you are bankrupt. The Muslims are bankrupt. Nobody died for your sins. Christ died for mine. <coughs> now, really speaking, is a most nonsensical question. Do you know that? It's a most nonsensical question. It's like me asking you that when you're hungry, who eats for you? <laughs> Sister, when you have a headache, who takes a pill for you? <laughs> when you have a rotten appendix, who gets operated on your behalf? It's a most nonsensical question. But the Christian is now making us to turn around and say, now who are? I'm searching and I can't find anybody. <laughs> so the Christian says, the Quran is not the word of God. We tell him, the Bible is not the word of God. Am I right? He says, you're going to go to hell. We say, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> so Allah tells us, Allah tells us, in Surah al tabut chapter 29. See, whenever anybody gives you any reference, make a point of going and checking up in your own translation. I said, al tabut and the A you'll find al tabut It's a chapter 29, you find 29. Ayah number 46, easy to find, easy to find. Once you found the chapter, Easy to find the ayah. Allah says, وَلَا تُجَادِلُوا أَحْلَ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا بِالَّتِي أَحْسَنْ And dispute not. We are told, don't dispute with the people of the book. Who are the people of the book? Jews and Christians. Don't dispute with them. إِلَّا بِالَّتِي أَحْسَنْ 
by mere disputation. But no better than that. No better than mere disputation. This is mere disputation. He says the Quran is not the last kalam. He said the Bible is not the word of God. He said you can go to hell. He said you can go to hell. He said you are black. I said you are also black. This is mere disputation. Allah says don't talk like that. But talk something better than that. How do we do better than that? In Mitchell's play, in a plaza. I was attending to the businessman and in walks a priest pastor, a colored priest. So I started chatting, he saw my videotapes, says yes. And any questions about that? He says, no, not really. So then I said, you see, the dispute between us two are these two books. These two books are dividing us. They say, yeah. I said, you see, you say the Quran is not the word of God and I say the Bible is not the word of God. He said, yes. But I said, you know, I will tell you why. I will tell you why the Bible is not the God's word. Why? He said, why? I said, let me give you a parable, an example. Your father and your mother, they are sleeping. In the middle of the night, a burglar gets in. And your father wakes up and he grapples with the burglar. But the burglar is too powerful. He flaws your father, sits on his chest and strangles him to death. And your father is gasping for breath. He's going to die any minute. And your mother comes to the rescue. Your dear mother comes to the rescue. And she saves your father's life. So your dad says, John, that's your name, he says, John, chop off your mother's hands. He says, Daddy, are you joking? He says, no, my son, I'm serious. He says, Daddy, have you been drinking? He says, no, my son, you know, we are born again Christians, we don't take that stuff. He says, no, you're like angels, immaculate. We don't take that stuff. Then, Daddy, you are crazy. Am I right? I'm asking the pastor. Am I right? If your father tells that your mother's hands must be chopped off for saving his life, then either he's drunk, but which he says he's not, and he's joking, he's not joking, so he's crazy. Am I right? He said, right. But your dad says, I'm inspired. He said, Daddy, who inspires you? The devil? He says, no, my son, I'm inspired by God. He said, Daddy, you are crazy and your God is also crazy. Am I right? <laughs> I'm asking the pastor, am I right? If your dad says that you must chop off your mother's hands for saving his life, you reason with the father and Daddy, this woman, my mother, gave you endless pleasures for 40 years. She gave you so many beautiful children. Now she saved your life and you want to chop off her hands? Daddy, you are crazy. He said, by God, he says, it is God. He said, Daddy, your God is also crazy. Am I right? He said, yes. <laughs> so I said, now, open, open. I had the Bible with me. I said, open. So, anybody can read English well, please come forward. Anybody, 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 young man, any young man, come. Good. Good. <laughs> I'll open it for you. Uh -huh. All right, all right, all right. So there's no the difference. Right, all right, all right. All right. Twenty-five verses eleven and twelve. Read it slowly that they can draw the message. Slowly. When men strive together to, uh -huh, what's that? What did you say? When men strive together. When men strive together in the struggle together, one with another. One with another. And the wife of the one, the wife of the one, draweth near. Draweth near. For to, for to deliver. For to deliver to save her husband. Her husband. Out of the hand, out of the hand of him, of him that smiteth him, that smite, that's beating him, yes, and putteth forth her hand, and putteth forth her hand, and taketh him by the secrets, taketh him by the secrets. Then thou shalt cut off her hand, then thou shalt cut off her hand. Thine eye shall not pity her, thy eye shall not pity her. Yes. So I said, look, you said just now, John, that your father is crazy and your God is crazy. <laughs> the woman who saved your father's life must chop off her hands and your father is crazy and your God is crazy. Am I right? He said, well, there must be an explanation. <laughs> I said, well, here it is. Explain, read it. In the context, there's no context. It's just by itself. This message is by itself. There's nothing before it to connect it and there's nothing after it to connect that verse, two verses. You chop off the woman's hand for saving your father's life. I said, your God is crazy and your father is crazy, right? He said, but you see, there must be an explanation. I said, no, what you do? Look, I said, I want you to find the explanation. Tonight, that night, 
in which I was playing in one of the masjid, I was holding a class as an exclusive for Muslims. But you, if you can have the answer, you come along and give the answer and you'll be qualified to attend the class. <laughs> I'd like to see you there tonight in the hotel. But it's so easy. Allah is telling us, don't just point a finger and say, you are false, you're going to go to hell. He said, you're going to go to hell. So your Quran is not the word of God. So your Bible is, don't talk yeah, like that. But do it better than that. And this better than that when you start, you'll find you can, alhamdulillah, you can do the job. And it's a privilege and a pleasure Allah is giving you. He's telling us in the Holy Quran that he's given you a deen, he's telling you the hero who Allah is now, Islam has a solution to all these problems of the West. One of the biggest problems is racism. Racism. In the whole world, everybody thinks he's better than the other. See? The poor African in South Africa is at the bottom end of the ladder, rung of the ladder. But he's also a racist. Do you know that? You see, if you add According to the apartheid system, the white man on top, the colored next to him, and the, and the Indian below the colored, and the African right down at the bottom. That's how the setup was. But now I say, you Africans, so you're complaining against us, you have a right to complain. If we are racist in our behavior, you have a right to complain. But I say, you are no less racist. He says, no, we are not racist. You know, because we are the unfortunate victims. So I'm asking the Zulu. I say, you Zulu? He said, yes. I said, what is Zulu? What is Zulu? Is Zulu in the language of the Zulu means the heavens. We are is Zulu means we are the heavenly people. The rest of the Africans, you say, they are Isilwane, means they are creatures. The Tosa is a creature, the Chwana is a creature, the Lesotho is a creature, creature is an insect. Right? I'm asking, I said, is that what you say in your language? You are the Zulu, means the heavenly people. And the rest of the Africans are Isilwan, creatures. I said, yes. I said, you see, you are also a racist. Can you see? No, this is sickness. This is a universal sickness. Everybody, to some degree, we will be the least racist. But we can't say we are 100%, we are pure. We are angels. We are also racist. We have all sicknesses. But there's a limit. So Islam offers not only tells you, Allah tells us in the Holy Quran, the eye of Hanas, it says, Oh mankind, inna khalakna kum min dhakar no unsa. Most certainly it is we who have created you from a single pair of a male and a female. Wa ja'alna kum shu'ubum wa qabayla. And it is we who have made you into nations and tribes. What for? To discriminate against one another? He said, the ta'ala, that you may recognize one another. This Ahmad, he is a Hindi, an Indian person. This Ahmad is a Malay Muslim. This Ahmad is a Khosa Muslim. This Ahmad is a Zulu. This Ahmad is an English Muslim. This Ahmad is a Scotch man. For purpose of recognition, for me, the label, Allah has made us unto me. But since we have not had false standards of judging people, Allah gives us a true standard. He says, Inna akramakum inna Allah So most certainly, the noblest in the sight of Allah is He who is the best in conduct. Not black or white, not rich or poor, but if your behavior is better than mine, then you are a better person. And if my behavior is better than yours, then I am a better person. It's got nothing to do with whether you are a Malay or I am a Hindi. It's got nothing to do with that. Your behavior towards mankind, my behavior towards mankind. So not only talking, but Islam has a system. Everybody talks about the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Everybody says that. But we know the cause Roman Catholic, different church. The Khaza Zulu, different church. The Basulu, different church. Linguistically, they're divided. Then racially, they're divided. For 300 years, they didn't have a black bishop in this country. The black man was not fit for 300 years to become a bishop. Now they have bishop Pupu, and they have some other two bishops. But now, for 300 years, no black bishops. The white master has to be the ruler, the pastor every situation. So the system, Islam brings you together five times a day, the rich and the poor, the black and the white, standing shoulder to shoulder, no gaps left, because the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said that when you stand up for prayer, you must not allow the devil to get in between you and your brother. This devil that he was talking about was not the guy we see in the art gallery, you know, already complexion, you know, with horns and sharp ears and a tape with a barbed hook, 
That type of devil, nobody will stand, allow him to stand here. You run for dear life. Me too. You run for dear life. The devil that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi was talking about was you yourself. Our racial pride, our arrogance, our riches. I am white, he is black. I am rich, he is poor. That devil must not be allowed to come in. So we start show you, show you five times a day, bring you to death. System, system. Talking is worthless. Practice, how to practice it. Islam solves the problem of surplus women. <coughs> they are Americans. I will tell you. And I met a Saudi friend. He tells me it's so easy to start with America. See, the American is a fittest guy for shaving the. You know why? Because physically he's big, gentle. You know, the, the Texan, the Texan, you know, the cowboys. You know? And the mentality is also like that. Yeah, you know, just, I'm very, you know, now I can, you can floor anybody, you see? Like most uh, the Indonesians and the Malaysians and the Bengalis, you know, somehow I, I happen to be a little expert called, I don't know how it happened. <laughs> but now, generally, our people are all like midgets in front of the mighty Texan. Yeah? So they've got that complex. I'm great. Right, what have you got? What have you got to say? Shh. So he is the easiest path. Because he's, he's relaxed. With you, with me, he's relaxed. So this Arab found a way. He meets an American, he goes to America. He says, you know, I'm from Arabia. Yes, yes. He said, I've got four wives. <laughs> no, that's the bait. Wallah. Every American fights. I've got four wives. Now nah, he wants to get it, you see. Huh? You give it. <laughs> no, it's a bait, it's a bait, you see. They say, no, no, you see, what I say is, what I mean is that I'm allowed to four wives. You say, I've got only one, but I'm allowed to four wives. But now the thing has started. You know, you people allow four wives? What about a woman having four husbands? Hmm? <laughs> so now this man is shading with me what he does. You know, this Saudi is telling me what he does. So he starts telling them, I said, look, you have a problem. So, you know, you got a problem. You Americans got a problem. And Islam offers you a solution to your problem. See, you have 7.8 million more women than men. It's a fact. If the, every American gets married, there will still be 7.8 million women who won't be able to get husbands in America. Did you know that? Seven and, that means nearly 8 million women can't get husbands. And on the manpower you have, sir, there are 25 million sodomites. Or the youth. You call them gays. Gays. <laughs> you know, such a beautiful word, Allah. This word gay was a beautiful word when I went to school. They were teaching me poetry. Gentle lords and ladies gay on the mountain dawns the day. No, I can't remember the rest. But now, you know, this person is happy and joyous. We say gay, very happy and gay. <laughs> Today, because the children is very gay. <laughs> you want to find me on the job. So you have 7.8 million women if every man got married, which will never happen. Man gets cold feet for so many reasons. You know that? Yeah. You know, the young man is not married. I said, what's wrong with you? Come on. I'll show you Mr. Dida's daughter. You know, good family, educated girl. And you know, come on, speak on your behalf. He said, right. And he's coming, coming. And then when the crunch comes along, uh, he, he finds a good excuse for him not to run thing to get each up. He knows why. He knows why. You see? He doesn't tell me. He won't tell you. Why? But he's get cold feet. So, a woman, I said, even if she is rigid, she doesn't mind having a husband. Somebody to give her protection. So 7.8 million to start with, women, no husbands. Then your man power, 25 million sort of wives. Another 25 million women can't get husbands. That's me, 32 million. And your prison population, 98% are males. Your problem is getting compounded. Hmm? 32 million women can't get husbands. So I said, literally, he says, your nation is going to the dogs. Literally, they are going to the dogs. Islam offers you a solution. If you don't listen, you simmer in your soup. So, start, man. Start this. Anything you can start with. Our Nabi said, but the one you are the Deliver the message you got me, even if it is one verse. You know one fact? Just shake. Just talk, man. Talk. Anything. You are the heart. Our hygiene. We are the most hygienic people in the, in the world. Poverty might make us to live in squalor. But we are the most hygienic people on earth. Now, we can go into any type of explanation, invite your neighbors for a cup of tea and the kusistas, and open the Quran, the birth of Jesus, the goodly people, the birth of Jesus, and 
شو بدنا مثلا ندس بيبيدي تسوى القرآن ساس وإس قالت الملائكة يا مريم سبحو ذا إنجل سيكون ميري إن الله استفاكي الله has chosen دي وتحركي purified دي واستفاكي على نساء العالمين chosen دي above the women of all nations and so on read it to them والله you will be able to do the job of work we need them we need them neighbors we can't afford to live like this because ethnic cleansing is taking place in Bosnia and the same thing can happen here. It can happen here. And then when that comes about, it says these people here are indigestible. You can't digest them. They are, you can't assimilate them. So only if you exterminate them. Then the African and the colored, Christian, colored, Christian, at the moment we carry the same identity, but the colored, the African, the white man, everybody will join, the Indian Christian, everybody will join in trying to exterminate us. I said, now, why wait for that one and start talking, sharing, and change the environment? We can change, Allah, we can change. Allah has given us the deen, he says, we use the hero of the deen. A deen, a way of life, it is a master of the one supersedes them all. Kulli, bulldoze them all. Kulli, wallahu kadeh al-mushrikun. Allah says, never mind how the mushrik might not like it. This is the destiny of his deen. So, my dear brothers and sisters, I have taken much of your time, and I will allow myself for you to ask questions. Thank you very much for this beautiful reception. Jazakallah with that name. Shukran Jazeelan, Brother Ahmed. I trust that I speak on behalf of all the people here. We thank you for having spent some time with us this evening, having once again put us on your itinerary. I would like to say that one day when you are called up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there will be many witnesses to be able to say, Ahmad Didat has done his job. There's no doubt about it. But Ahmad Didat has done his job well. He has presented for us over all the years with all the ammunition that we would ever need to have a civilized discussion with those people who run Islam down. He has printed these booklets either free or at a very, very cost, uh, uh, cheap price. Five rands for a book of this nature and this caliber. Ten rands for this beautiful volume this encyclopedia, this book of laws of Allah's Kalam. And those are only some of the things. The problem that we have is we are indeed pleased to see so many ladies here this evening. Shukran. You are the mothers of the Ummah. We are pleased to see so many brothers here. And I've been with Brother Ahmad since 1984. The first time I joined his program and you'll be surprised to see the same people here every time that's lovely it means they get some beautiful benefit from it or maybe there are some who come for the entertainment but I'm sure it is not Brother Ahmad's intention to entertain us then you should have been on Greenpoint track tonight Al Jerome is there, you missed that by the way but when the ammunition is given us, we must please continue the work which he has been doing. He's not here forever. And if we can promise ourselves and promise him that we will carry on with the help of the tools he's put in our hands, then he can live in peace. We now come to question time. The questioning there's a microphone, front end of the microphone. Well, people are trying to think about the questions. Uh, let me have a word with you. This book, The Choice. This is part of the work that the French had thrown back. This book here, The Choice. Some 236 pages here. Hard cover, gold embossed, gold embossed, hard cover, five rounds. Now, we Muslims are really not a reading people. Allah Baritala describes us as an Ikra community. 
The first word of Wahi that Allah gives over Nabi Karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the word Iqra. Read. But in our practice, we don't read. Not even newspapers. Some most of our people don't even read newspapers. <laughs> we are not a reading people. But now, if you are a reading person, you'll find out the value of a book. Here, I have a book in my hand here, and the title of the book is "Bring Out the Magic in Your Mind." Bring out the magic in your mind, positive thinking. And I'm interested in things like that. The worldwide bestseller that can launch you on the road to success. Who doesn't like to be launched on the road to success? So I picked up this book from the bookshop. And I look at the price. It says 24.99 plus GST. 24, 25 bucks for this. Similar number of pages to mine. 25 pounds plus GST. Hmm? I said, I don't want it. But then I see the word here, Al-Quran, Al-Quran. I said, man, something must be about the Quran. So I went and bought it. I got caught. This guy, the Christian fellow, has used this as a non proof, like a pen, pen name. I got caught 25 times. <laughs> Just compare with that. Hardcover, stolen property, or liquidation stock. <laughs> I assure you it's neither, it's neither stolen property nor liquidation stock. It's highly subsidized. We want you to have it. Buy them for your friends, non-Muslim friends, Muslim friends, your brother-in-laws. Buy them five rands each. Buy a few at a time. Five rands each. And by the time you go out, if they are finished, you can get them at the Rossmead. In the same Rossmead Avenue, this hall is on. Rossmead Avenue. Rossmead Supermarket. Ten rands for the Quran. A veritable encyclopedia of 2,000 pages, 10 rats. And this book here, 5 rats. Right, any questions? Thank you, my child. Alhamdulillah. Here's my sister. I would like to ask a question. Um, I'm very curious about it. Um, Mr. Ahmed, you get to see to us now the the Quran is the word of Allah, and the Bible is so-called the word of Jesus Christ, or the Lord, what they call. But um, what I would like to know is, um, Ahmed, where you have studied the Bible? Have you ever come across a verse where they stated that um, Jesus Christ or um, God said? Because as far as I have Studied it, it's all St. Luke's said, St. Mark's, St. Paul's, Matthew's, but never once did I come across that Jesus said. Could you please um, clear that for me? Yes, yes, my sister. Yes, my sister. You see, the Bible, the Bible, we say is not the word of God, per se, as a whole, is not the word of God. But there is a word of God inside. There are statements, like for example, we quote in our book what the Bible says about Muhammad, a verse called Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18, where it says, I will raise them up a prophet from among the brethren likened to thee, and I will put my words in his mouth. Who is this I talking? You ask the Jew, it says God. If you ask the Christian, it says who is talking? It says God. It sounds like Allah's kalam. <laughs> I, I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words which he, that prophet, shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. It sounds like the word of God. And I have no hesitation in accepting that as the word of God. Then we read again in the book of Isaiah. God speaks to Isaiah. said, I, I am God and there's none else. I am God and there's none like me. No hesitation in accepting that God is talking. There's a type of evidence in the Bible which we can recognize any sensible person that it sounds like God talking. Then there's another type of evidence in the Bible where it sounds like Jesus talking, a man of prophet of God. He says, it has been said about them of old time that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, Whosoever looketh upon a woman who lust after her had committed adultery with her already in his heart. 
And that's what I say to you. Who is talking? Jesus. Not God. Jesus is talking. It has been said by them of old time. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you. Who says I? Jesus. So we find that the word of God is there. The word of the prophet is there. Then we find another type of evidence in the Bible. Where it says, while he, Jesus, was going forth into the way, he, Jesus, saw a tax collector called Matthew. He came up to him, Matthew, and said unto him, Matthew, follow me, Jesus, and he, Matthew, followed him. Now, this is not the word of God, this is not the word of Jesus, and not even the word of Matthew. Now, it's so, so simple. There's somebody else is talking, maybe an eyewitness or a ear witness. So now we Muslims, when we say we believe in the Torah, we believe in the Zahur, we believe in the Injil, and we believe in the Furqan. Furqan is the Quran. When we say Torah, Zahur, and Injil, what we mean is that the Wahi, the revelation Allah gave Hazrat Musa salam, that Wahi we call Torah. The Wahi, or the revelation that Allah gave Hazrat Dawud salam, that revelation we call Zahur. And the revelation, the Wahi, Allah gave Hazrat Isa salam, Jesus Christ, that we call Injil. Now, the Christians have, in Arabic Bible they write, Injile Mark Matthew, Injile Marcus, near Matt, Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Mark, Injile Lucas, Gospel of Luke, Injile Johanna, Gospel of John, this is Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We say, we believe in the Injile Isa, the Gospel of Jesus. Have you got it? He hasn't got it. You see, we believe in the revelation Allah gave to Isa alayhi salam. Because the Bible says that when he went to a certain place, he preached the gospel. He went to another place, the Bible says, and he preached the gospel. And he went to somewhere else and he preached the gospel. I said, did he have a book under his arm? Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Or Acts of Philippians, Galatians, Corinthians. What did he have under his arm? Did he have a book? No. So I so said, what did he preach? What he preached is the Bible. What Allah gave him, he preached. If you can have it, if you got it, we ask the Christian, show it to us and we'll accept it. But you haven't got it. They have a Bible called the Red Letter Bible. You can buy the expensive Red Letter Bible. That Red Letter Bible means everything that Jesus is supposed to have spoken. And those words are in red. And you'll find that 90% of that Bible is black. 90% of that New Testament, those 27 book is black. Not even a red dot. 90%. So that is what they are telling us, that 90% is not even, from their point of view, is not even the word of Jesus. So what we say is that Rabahi given to them, we accept, but they haven't got it. It's all written by man. Then there are other types of evidence in the Bible, which no decent man can read to his mother, or wife, or sister, or daughter. And I'm conducting classes. I say, just to a select group of 30, 30, 30. And I show you, I argue that there are things here that when you make that Christian to read, when he visits your house, I said, open up for him, Genesis chapter 19, verse 30, and give it to him. This missionary is when they come to your house. Say, do this, do this. And you watch, watch him. He's going to scan the book words. And he smells a rat, and he won't read it. He won't change the subject. You know, what about your husband does? You know, what's the price of onions? <laughs> I said, look, I want you to read this. If he doesn't, I said, you read it. After reading it, ask him, what is the moral of this? Filthy, dirty stories. And again, another one. Incest, incest. Father committing incest with his daughters. Son with his mother. Father in law with his daughter in law. Brother raping sister. And one of the sons of Dawud he rapes his mother's own say. He rapes them both all here in this book of God. But now we don't know, so they're pushing it down your throat. They're pushing this book down your throat because you don't know what you're bargaining for. But once you know, then it's another. Guru, come, come, read this. Now you tell me. Do you read this to your mother? Can you read this to your sister? Can you read this to your daughter? And even to your fiancé, if she is a good lady, you can't read it to her. So you must be armed. We must be armed. But otherwise, about six, seven, seven, seven or eight masjids are delivered box. And every masjid I'm asking the question, is there a single Muslim whose door has not been knocked by a Christian yet? Put up your hand. First masjid, not one. Second masjid, not one. Third masjid, not one. Fourth masjid, not one. Fifth one, one guy put up his hand, one old man. 
I didn't know whether he understood my question, but right? I didn't have to ask him whether he's given an IV tower, you know, out of reach from all the people. But what? Well, then, this yesterday, so I met another man, another old man. But 100% everybody, everybody is God is being No. I say, is that the rule Islam offers for us? That we become a doormat for people, doormat who they come to wipe their feet upon us, who use us as a punching bag. Practice. This is not the rule. Allah says, He's given you a rule, you use a hero quality. That is to master, overcome, and supersede them all. Kulli. Wakafa billahi shahida. And enough is Allah is a witness to this fact. He said that He's going to make His deed to prevail. With you or without you. There is a privilege Allah has given you. That we can share His deed. Do the works of the prophets of God and earn the prophets reward. If we will take it. But we have to be armed. In this environment, ocean of Christianity, this is an ocean of Christianity. And they are making a concerted effort to see that they change us. If not we, our children. But now we have to turn the tables. And the only way we can turn the tables is arm yourself. Get these little booklets, master a verse and talk. Master a verse and talk. Even neighbors. I'm not talking about the professionals. The professionals, there's a special treatment for them. But the ordinary person, show them the Quran, read the Quran, read these little booklets of mine and share with them. Inshallah, you'll be able to do the job. We need you, my sisters. We need you. The Muslims so far have been fighting with one hand. The Christian is fighting with both. Men and women come and knock at your door. They're both working, husband and wife, they're working. We are only the men who's working, if at all. So it's about time that my sisters also got involved. Yes, my sister. Um, my question is, it's obvious that the New World Order is anti-Islamic and the target is the Muslim world. Why are the Muslims so passive about it? Why aren't they doing anything about it? And they're like rabbits in front of being mobilized by a, a light. What's happening to the Muslims? It is my sad. You know, it's very sad. It is very sad. You see, we have stopped doing the job of Dawa for a thousand years. We have done it. Initially, the Muslims came out from the desert fastness. They went to do business with our people in India. And our people, my people, came into contact with them, said these Arabs are good people. We also like to be one of you. So it's very easy. Give the hand. So we gave the hand, our fathers, my grandfathers. This is a lie, la ilaha Muhammad Rasulullah, we did it. They said, now from now on you are a Muslim, you must, you know, don't eat the pig, don't eat dead animals, don't eat uh, blood, <laughs> don't drink alcohol, <laughs> whatever the Sunni says. Make salat, so we go do like this. So we joined. We joined. They went to Malaysia, same thing. They went to Indonesia, same thing. East Africa, West Africa. The Arab trader, he converted the people. He didn't go out matching his wits against the Hindus, my people, or against the Buddhists, the Indonesians, the Buddhists before. They didn't go around teaching them, so look, this Buddha is not a god, and mm -hmm. they just say good behavior, it attracted the people. But now today, people are brainwashed. You see, the people are brainwashed, and now you have to talk. You have to learn to talk, but you haven't been talking for a thousand years. We went and conquered Spain, 800 years. 800 years the Muslims in Spain. And in 800 years, Eventually, when we were kicked out, there was not, not one man left in that country to give their sign. Why? We didn't do the job. We didn't do the job. So the thing is now, because you didn't do the job, you lost the art. So somehow, by circumstances, I was forced into these situations. So I'm now giving my experience. I said, look, man, it's so easy to talk to the American, to the British, to the French. If the guy will give me a chance to talk to him, you can bulldoze anybody. Whether it be Hindu, Christian, Jew, atheist, anybody we can bulldoze if we are given the opportunity. Intellectual. Not with a gun. Even if we had the laser gun. Allah says, like Rafid thing. No compassion. You can't use it. Disqualify. But with the intellect, we can do the job. Allah, we can do the job. But now, since we didn't do the job for a thousand years, you lost the art. Your forefathers, you know, I don't know if you might remember, most of them Malaysian tailors and carpenters and things like that. But if you don't do this tailoring for four, five years, ten years, finish, it's gone. You can't even make a buttonhole. Do you know that? You know this buttonhole is an art to make this buttonhole. Cutting the hole is easy. But to have the thing thread right around and around to protect that hole from spreading, it's an art. If you did do the job, you say, look, your grandfather was a very good, good tailor, and your great grandfather was a good tailor. <laughs> you can't make a buttonhole, sister. What's wrong? You, you didn't do the job. So we stop doing the job, therefore we find ourselves in this situation. Militarily, we are not a power compared to the West, we are nothing. But intellectually, we can give battle to them all and win, and win them over. 
make them our slaves. We can make them our slaves. Voluntarily, voluntarily the person can become your slave. Once he recognizes that this is Dinul Haq, this is the right way, and when he opts for it, he will fight harder than you and I. But the thing now is we have to start in our immediate environment. I can't tell you why are the Arabs doing this, and why are the Turks doing that, and why don't the Pakistanis do that, but wherever I go, I will get started and in your own environment. The Christian is knocking at your door in Pakistan. They are boasting, they have converted more Pakistanis into Christianity since independence than in the previous hundred years of British rule. They have converted more Bangladeshis into Christianity since independence than in the previous hundred years of British rule. They have converted 15 million Indonesians into Christianity. And by the turn of the century, they want to make Indonesia a Christian nation. And they every sign that they will succeed. So the thing is now, it's about time that we, in our own little environment, we start opening our mouth. That our duty is there to start in our own environment. According to our capacity, just talk and talk. And inshallah, if everybody starts waking up to the responsibility, we'll do that. We'll be able to turn the tables. <laughs> I had a friend, she was a lady at work, um, with regards to religion. Okay? And I pointed out to her own text in the Bible. But then she brings another copy to me. And on the cover, there's a man standing, standing there with a sword. As if to say now that Islam came about as a result of the sword. And so I told her, no, this cannot be. You know, I tried to prove myself. But now I want to answer from you now how I can give a better answer. <laughs> the insinuation that this lady you're talking about she makes is that Islam was spread at the point of the sword. And she produced a book with a picture that on the cover, drawing by someone's by hand, hand drawing, to say man with the sword, assuming, presuming that he's Muhammad, that he spread his religion at the point of the sword. That's, that's his charge. When he said, look, you know, you find Thomas Carlyle, one of the greatest kings of the past century, in 1840. He delivered a series of talks on the topic, the hero and hero worship. And he chose our Nabi as his hero prophet, 1840, one of the greatest thinkers of the past century. And he defends our Nabi Karim Sarasan against the charge of the sword. He said, the sword indeed, the sword indeed, but where will you get your sword? He said, every new opinion at its beginning is precisely in the minority of one. In one man's head alone, there it dwells as yet. That one man, take up a sword and try to propagate with that will do little for him. One man against the whole world. Because the Mushriks of Makkah, they were not waiting for a prophet. They were not waiting for a leader. They were satisfied with their idol worship. Here comes along a man, as this guy Lama Tim described, you know, smallness of means, no political party to back him up, no royalty to back him up. He's one man against all men. And he take a sword and try to propagate with that will do little for him. He said, first you must get your sword. Now talking about the sword, your Jesus, your Lord Jesus, he says. Luke chapter 19, verse 27, he says, For those of my enemies, who will not that I should rule over them, bring them hither and slay them before me. Your God. He said, Think ye that I come to send peace on earth? I am come not to send peace but a sword. And what do I care if the fire is already lit? Is that your Jesus? Who's talking? Your Jesus Christ. He is the man of the sword. He went to the temple and he beat up the people in the temple with a whip, a potted whip. And he threw it up to the tables of the money changers and he whipped them and chased them out of the temple. Your God. Jesus. Now you show any such example about Muhammad. There's nothing. So you are tongue sucking something. But now look at your own book. Jesus said, judge not that he be not judged. For with that judgment he judge, he shall be judged. And with that measure he meet, he shall be measured unto you. So you hypocrite, why do you see the mote in your brother's eyes and see it not the beam in that own eye? So first take out the beam from your own eye. This is the lesson for that lady of yours. Show her. This is what your Bible says about Jesus, that he said he's come with a sword and he's come to light fire, and what do I say? It is already late. Um, 
I would like to know how you envisage a new world order if in the first period of Islam when the numbers of Muslims were not so large, they conquered far more land and they were better able to protect themselves and with Muslims having increased up to a billion almost now, they are not able to defend themselves even collectively and ethnic cleansing and given the onslaught and the encroachment of other morals in the society. How do you envisage a new world order if by numbers we really increase and we manage to convert numbers to property? The new world order is to be based on a new world constitution. And that constitution is the Quran. It gives you a solution to all your problems. Jesus Christ, he told his disciples before parting, he said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. You haven't got that capacity. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you all truth. For he shall not speak from himself. But what things shall he hear, that shall he speak. And he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. We say, that spirit of truth is Muhammad. And he left behind this constitution. We establish the kingdom of God on earth. It is the Muslim duty now to propagate and make people away, make, become, make them conscious. We establish this new order. Yes, um, I converted to Islam about one and a half years Masha. ago. Masha. And, um, but I come from a very um, staunch Christian Masha. family. Masha. My grandfather is a pastor. Yes. I guess my question is just what advice do you have to people like me with very close um, Christian family and friends? Yes. <laughs> my advice is that generally the non Muslim, they don't know the high position that Jesus Christ occupies in the house of Islam. They do. When we are telling them that we believe in Jesus, they think it's hypocritical. You know, we just find a bluff up. Trying to be nice with them so they can be nice with us. That is what they are assuming. So the best way is, if you have a Quran, it says, Mommy, Daddy, just listen to this. Just listen to this. What do you think of this? And if you can read it to your mommy and daddy. So, why is Qalatil Malaika to Ya Maryam? So, behold, the angel said, O Mary, in Allah has tafaki, Allah has chosen thee, wa taharaki, purified thee, wa stafaki, Allah has chosen thee above the women of all nations. So, mommy, daddy, such an honor is not to be found given to Mary, the mother of Jesus, even in the Christian life. What makes Muhammad to say these things? He is honoring Mary, the mother of Jesus, that she is a woman chosen above the women of all nations. What makes an Arab, in the first instance, telling other Arabs, actually provoking them, that the Jewess, the mother of Jesus, she was chosen above the women of all nations, not his own mother or wife or daughter. When we believe that his daughter Fatima will be the leader of the women of paradise. We believe that. But her name is not even mentioned in the Quran. But Mary, not only that she is the only woman whose name is mentioned, but there is a chapter in the Quran called Surah Maryam, chapter May, in honor of the name of the mother of Jesus. Such an honor is not to be found given to in our Bible, the Roman Catholic Bible, 73 books, not one is Maryam. The Roman, the Protestant Bible, 66 books, not one is Maryam. But in the Quran, there is a chapter called Surah Maryam, chapter Mary, in honor of the name of the mother of Jesus Christ. Now. What is they getting stuck in the throat? The Quran continues. Ya Maryam Kuti, Rabbi Ki, was to the work at Ima Rati. So, O Mary, worship her Lord devoutly, prostrate thyself and bow down and pray with those who bow down. Thy kingdom by Raibi, Muhi, Reka. This is part of the tidings of the things unseen which we reveal unto thee, O Apostle, by inspiration. For Ma Kunta Ladehim is the Tunas. This is in Kuna Alamahum. He said, You were not there, O Muhammad, when they cast lots with arrows, as to which of them should be charged with the care of Mary. Nor was thou with them when they disputed the point. And it continues. By his father, Til Malai, Katuya, Mariam, behold, the angel said, O Mary, in Allah, you are Shiruki, be Kalimatim Minhu, that Allah gives you glad tidings of the word from him. His Mughul Masih, his name is the Messiah, Isa bin Maryama, Jesus the son of Mary, Wajihan fi dunya wal akhira, held in honor in this world and in the hereafter, wa minal muqarrabin, let the company of those nearest to God. Now, when you read this, let's say, if you can't read Arabic, now just read it in English. 
And if a person is not jaundiced, not really sick spiritually, jaundiced, sick, he will be able to appreciate. He says, this is wonderful, this is beautiful. And all the story is something closest to his heart, closest to our heart, what you are reading there. And there is not a single word that they can take exception to. Sana, mommy, daddy, brothers, mama, get all this. Why would he say all these beautiful things? That the his birth, the birth is Jesus. When the good news is given to Mary about the birth of the Holy Child, the Holy Child. She said, Qalat Rakyana Yakum Ji Waladam, Walam Yam Sasmi Basha. She said, Oh my Lord, how shall I have a child when no man has touched me? So the angel says in reply, Qala Adali Illa Yahukuma Yasha, even so Allah creates what he wills. He's a Tada Amran, whenever he decrees a matter, Fa in Lama Yakul Lahu Kun Fayakun. He merely says to it be and it is. For Allah to create a Jesus without a human father, the Quran says just like that. He wants to create a million Jesuses without father, without mother, just like that. But the Bible says, what does the Bible say? The Bible says the Holy Ghost will come upon thee and the power of the Most High will overshadow thee, giving people the mental picture of a man or an animal having a relationship. The Holy Ghost will come on her and the power of the Most High will overshadow her. The Quran says for God to create just like that. When they read this, I have read these two questions. And this is, man, this is exactly like my book. I see it's on the face of it. If a Christian reads that, without the Arabic being there, in a hundred years, your father, your mother will never guess he's reading the Quran. In a hundred years, if he keeps on reading, he might think maybe this is a Roman Catholic version of the Bible if he hasn't seen one. Maybe this is the Greek Orthodox version of the Bible if he hasn't seen one. Or maybe this is the New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses if he hasn't seen one. But he'll never guess he's reading the Quran. You know why? Because it's so close to his heart. If the heart is not diseased, it means much spiritually jaundiced. But if the person is jaundiced, like the father of Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he reasons with his father. He says, oh my father, yeah, but he, you know, knowledge has come to me which has not reached. Oh my father, four times in succession, every eye. Oh my father, oh my father, this is how a beautiful son, a beautiful daughter to do. Oh my father, oh my mommy, mommy, I care for you. I, but now at the end of it, the father reacts. He says, hey, Ibrahim, get out of my sight for a good long while. I'll show you to death. That can happen. In that case, we say there is a khata of majah jahiluna taru salam. That when you meet the ignorant one who address you arrogantly, say peace. Your mother and your father are still your mother and father. You've got to love them, respect them, revere them, but don't follow them. When in the matters of religion, that is the only thing. Otherwise, you can still love them, kiss them, mourn with them. And if they are better than your mother, you can have every right to do all the things that you're supposed to do to your mom and your dad. Bahu.